if you weren't here, we began a three-part series. So this is part two. The series is called This Is Us, and we've been doing kind of a parallel between our family and the This Is Us family, for those of you who are familiar with the television show. This morning, as I'm getting started, I want you to see a clip, and it's a clip of Jack, the father, and his son, Randall, having a conversation about the differences that Randall feels about himself. You see, Randall was adopted, and he's black, living in a white family. And he's very, very smart. And he gets to this space where he realizes these things. He sees these things about himself, but he doesn't want to stand out. He doesn't want to be known for how he's different. And so his dad's going to try and help him understand about the value of being different in all the best, good, right ways. And I want you to hear this as he shares this with his son, and as you do to think about your own life and the way in which God made you different. Take a look. The reason that message resonates with me is I feel like that's a message that's saturated in the scriptures. I think that's God's message to us over and over and over again. Don't dumb down your life. Don't try to be somebody that you're not just so that you fit in with people who aren't going to accept you anyway. I want you to be the kind of person who understands how God made you and to be the best version of that. God would never ask you to be me or me you. He just wants us in all of our fullness to be the best versions of ourselves. But that's a message that I feel like as I share that today, I feel like if we embrace that message, we're swimming against the cultural tide. Because there's a strong, strong push to form groups of people that you feel comfortable with, thinking like, looking like, voting like, acting like, and drawing hard lines of division between yourself and between somebody who doesn't fall into the category that you do. I feel like that's increasingly becoming very evident with every passing day in our larger culture. But that's a message that I reject and the reason that I reject it is because I think that Christ and his kingdom reject that message. I want, as we're unpacking a little bit the vision statement, I told you earlier that the series that we're doing is based around the vision that we have for the kind of people, the kind of community that we want to be. We are clearly Christian. We are a community of people who are gathered around the Christ central to everything that we do, we are Christian. Last week we talked about how, as Christians, we need to constantly be in a state where transformation is being continually borne out in our lives. That we don't get to the space where we think, oh, well, I've arrived. These set of doctrines or these set of ideologies or these philosophies that I ascribe to, got it. No more need for further information. No more need for transformation. I'm as good as it gets. And so on and so forth. No. You and I should always, for the rest of the days of our lives, be thinking about and seeking, how do I grow today? How do I learn today? How do I become today? And the only way to do that is to keep your mind and your heart open. Because once you close both, you're dead. So we are a Christian community where transformation is to be continual. But the second piece that I want to drill down on today is that we recognize and celebrate our diversity and our differences. We don't just tolerate them. Toleration is terrible. Who among us wants to be tolerated by the other? It's a terrible thing. No. We're to be celebrated for who we are. And eventually next week, where we, at the very heart of who we are, make love central. Now these are aspirations that we ascribe to. This is the kind of community that we want to be. And so if this is a place you're looking for a church, or 
This is your church. I just want you to know that the way in which we become like that is by all buying into that reality. If that's not something you ascribe to or not something you want to be a part of, then probably there's a different place for you. But the ethic of what we believe this church is to be about is a different kind of message. Because oftentimes, the message that's received from places like this are very different. And so, when I woke up this morning and I looked at the notes that I had for what I wanted to share with you, I was telling Colin earlier, I looked at it and thought, blah, this is awful, <laughs> this is terrible. Now, I might be over-exaggerating the point, but the reality is I didn't feel good with the material. Not because it wasn't something good, but it just wasn't, it just wasn't good for me today. So everything I'm going to share with you is off script. So I'm going to just step out there, okay? I want you to think with me about your favorite story that you know of Jesus. For those who are familiar with him, Jesus might be new to you, so you might not know a lot of stories about Jesus, but I want you to think about your favorite stories, those stories either that he's telling or that he's living. And I want you to think about why it is that you like that story or that story or another story. When I was thinking and doing my preparation this week, I was thinking about about Christ and the kind of kingdom that he came to set up because he talks an awful lot about the kind of kingdom that he wants to have. And I kept going back to this idea of how Christ really is irritating in a lot of ways. He's irritating because he pushes at the boundaries of people that he won't let them stay in their places of comfort. It's like he wants to go to a different land and his disciples say, we can't go there. He's like, what do you mean we can't go there? We have to go there. Yeah, but yeah, but they're different. They're like unholy. They're not good. He won't let them stay there. He says, well, if you guys aren't going to go, I'm going. And then he goes to this town and he meets this woman in Samaria. Samaria was off limits and Samaritans were off limits. And he meets this woman by the well. And he encounters her. And the reason that she's there in the middle of the day drawing water is because she has been shamed from her community. She's kind of loose in her morals. She's had one relationship after another relationship after another relationship. And she just doesn't want to be bothered with the other ladies who come and gossip at the well in the early morning hours. So she comes in the middle of the day when it's super hot and nobody else is going to be there. And as she does, she encounters Christ. But she doesn't know who he is. He knows her. She doesn't know him. And he gets into this conversation, and at the end of it all, he basically offers her living water, water that she's not going to have to keep coming back to the well in the hottest part of the day, and she's like, where do I sign up? And he points her to himself, and he invites her into a new way of living and being. And he says to her, he says, you've been with five husbands, and the guy you're with now is not your husband at all. And he said, I want you to think about where you have been seeking your identity, your security, your comfort. And I want you to obliterate that. And I don't want you to seek for it in another relationship for it. I want you to see what's right in front of you. And she opens her heart and she opens her mind and it changes her life. And then... She goes back into her village, the village that she has been shamed from, and she tells the people there about a man she's met who's changed her life, and she brings them back. And I don't know how many, but it, it seems like a full house in front of him. And as these Samaritans, these unwanted, unholy, unrighteous, dirty people come, Jesus offers them the same, and they accept it. And the whole town comes to faith and receives new life in Christ. His disciples didn't even want to go. And because he wanted to, because he had to, an entire town was changed. It should make perfect sense, right? He was always pushing at the boundaries, at the margins, at the edges. He was always trying to teach his friends and his disciples, those who were trying to learn from him, a different way. He would go up to lepers and touch them. Why? Why? because nobody else would. 
Can you imagine what it would be like day after day, week after week, month after month, to be shunned from a community and to not have an embrace from someone who cares for you? And they're like, no, 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 don't touch them. You're going to get it. He's like, what are you talking about? And he would embrace them. People who were demon-possessed, deranged, out of their minds, scared entire towns, with a word, with a touch, he would speak to their mania. And in a word, in a moment, in a touch, he would bring peace to their lives. You see, it wasn't about the category of person, where they were from. It wasn't about what was going on in their life, about what kind of problems that they had, about what kind of difficulties that they were suffering. It wasn't about their gender or their age or their status or how much money they had. It wasn't about any of those things. There were no barriers for Jesus. And that's where it gets kind of irritating. You see, because as long as it's somebody else's prejudice that he is bursting, it's fine, it's good. But let him bump up against the prejudice that you have, the bias that you have, and then it's a different story. You see, because the reality is, if you were born on planet Earth, you're going to grow up in a system that teaches you that some people are good and some people are not. That some people are acceptable and other people are not. That are going to draw strong lines boundaries, divisions, keeping people at arm's length so that you don't have to deal with the difference. But when you don't deal with the difference, you miss out on the best of all possible worlds, and that is God created a beautiful, different, diverse, colorful world in which all of us have the capacity to learn from and be blessed by. But if we cordon ourselves off from that, well then, we miss out. And this is something that you and I simply cannot do because the kingdom of God is not a country club. It is not. It is not a place for people who look and talk and act and think and vote like us. The kingdom of God have doors that are open wide to everyone, even the least five that you want seated at the table with you. And that's where the rub comes in. Because when you were watching this drama sketch played out, I hope you were thinking about the least five that you wanted there. And I hope you were letting the weight and the profundity of what these beautiful, wonderful people spelled out for us. Because whether it's two or three or four or five, we all have a table. And as long as Jesus is hitting on other people's stuff, it's okay. But then when he bumps up against our stuff and we have to take a look at that and really think about that, that's where it gets difficult. But my favorite stories of Jesus are where he's doing that. A lot of times when he would teach, he would tell stories and he would always make, or not always, but often make the hero of the story the least likely person, right? So like the Good Samaritan story. When you have religious people walking down a road and they see somebody bloodied and beaten and lying on the side of the road and they couldn't have the time because they were going to the temple. But then this Samaritan dog comes along and he sees and he bandages and he treats and he puts on his donkey and he takes to an inn and he pays the innkeeper to take care of and however long and whatever the cost, he's going to take care of it. This total stranger, this guy's the hero. Jesus had a remarkable way of flipping the tables. And so when he was teaching his friends what it was to be like, he would expose to them these things that would blow their mind. But then when he left them, his hope was that with the birth of the church that they would understand that, that they would receive that, and they would pass it on. In Acts chapter 2, you read the story of the Pentecost, right, where people are gathered from all over. What a beautiful strategic move. That the church is born when people from all over the world gather in one place. He didn't start it with one kind of people. He started it with all kinds of people who gathered in one space. And that was the beginning of the birth of something beautiful and wonderful and marvelous. When Nevaeh was reading earlier in the prelude, this passage in Ephesians chapter 2, if you weren't here earlier, I just want to read a piece of it because 
it's really, really profound what the cross is and does for helping us to understand and appreciate and celebrate the differences that God created us with. In Ephesians chapter 2, and you don't have to follow, you can if you like, but there's this message, and I want to read just prior to what she was sharing in verse 11, Ephesians chapter 2. This is this letter that the Apostle Paul writes to this church, and he's trying to help them understand something that they've forgotten, but that's really, really important. And he says, verse 11, he says, Don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision. And even though it only affected their bodies and not their hearts, in those days you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel. And you did not know the covenant promises God had made to them. You lived in this world without God and without hope, but now you've been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but now you've been brought near to Him through the blood of Christ. For Christ Himself has brought peace to us. He united Jew and Gentile into one people. When in His own body on the cross, He broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jew and Gentile by creating in Himself one new people from the two groups. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of His death on the cross and our hostility towards each other was put to death. And what I get from this is that the cross is not just a saving instrument, a bridge that is brought to bring about two disparate groups of people together, reconciled and redeemed, but the cross is also a sledgehammer dividing the walls that separate the people who seem furthest removed from each other. The cross is a bridge, it's a sledgehammer too. And so Christ passed it on to his followers and his followers on their best days understood it. That's why there's so many letters in the New Testament because they keep forgetting all the things that he was trying to teach them. But then, as he passed it on to them, John, in the final book of the Bible, in the book of Revelation, records this picture, records this scene. It's as if he pulls back the curtains of what heaven will look like. And he says, after this, I saw a vast crowd, too great to count from every nation and tribe and people and language, standing in front of the throne, before the Lamb. You see, I think if he could have kept extending the categories of people, he would. Because in the throne room of God, at the end of time, what you will see are no divisions, no dividing walls, no separation, no differences. It's not that he's colorblind. He sees all of it. We're not to be colorblind. We're to appreciate color. I don't want to live in a black and white world. I want to see all of it and appreciate and learn from and grow from. And that's the best way because I don't understand what it's like to be a woman or to be black or to be a variety of a million other things. But as we in community together learn about each other and grow from our relationships in one another, I think it's a win for everybody. But this is hard work. Why? Because it's far easier being with people who think like you do, who believe like you do. I mean, it's irritating to be with somebody who just vehemently disagrees with the basic premise that you have about how life is, right? But why make that personal? We do. But why? I'm asking you this morning, as we think about the kind of church that we want to be, I'm asking you to consider your own prejudices, your own fears, your anxieties, the anger, the frustration, the stuff that's inside of you that shouldn't be, 
the stuff that you've made a home for that doesn't deserve one. And I'm asking you to come to terms with that. And perhaps by God's grace and with each other's help, we can help each other, understanding that we all have stuff that we've got to deal with. Because to the degree that we don't, then what we do is form a country club. And I'm not interested in that, and I don't think Jesus is either. The reason I think that John gives us a picture of what's to come is so that we can start practicing right now and getting comfortable with the idea of what it's going to be like at the end of days. And so if this is where we're moving towards, then maybe we should step in a direction towards that rather than away from it. Listen, I don't know who would be at the five for you. Maybe it's just two or three. Maybe it's just one. But I urge you, I beg you, to come to terms with the places in which your life stands over and against the desires that Christ has for you. Because you're going to miss out. And you get one life. You have one one and only life to live. And probably, for many of us, we have for too long lived with places where there was no room at the table for certain people. The kingdom of God is an open kingdom. And we best represent Christ when we live as He did. When we go where He went, where we touch, where we speak, where we act in a way that is appropriate with what we see borne out in his life. And when we do, we get to be the hero of the story. Because with eyes and ears and hearts open and the light bulb comes on, we're stepping into the way of being for what he's intended for all along. Some of the stuff that we have in our lives, it's deep-rooted. And it's difficult to come to terms with why we feel the way we do. But you and I, no matter what the differences we share, we all know there's no place for, for hatred in our hearts. We all know that there is no room for creating distance and space between another human and ourselves. And so what I want to do as we close our time together is I want to ask you to stand. And I want to ask you to do something, and I hope that you will, and that is to open your hands, palms up. This is a gesture of surrender and release. And as I pray this prayer as we close together, I want you to come to terms and at least with the idea of beginning to take the first step in a direction towards the vision that this church and that Christ and his kingdom have for us. And part of what that will mean is that you have to let go of some stuff. And this might be the first of many times, but as you let go of stuff, the chances are really good that you'll leave here a little bit lighter and a little more free. And as you travel down that road, just keep letting go of the things that stand between you and God's best for you. I want you to be different in all the best ways. I don't want you to dumb down your life so that you fit in with somebody else. I want you to be the best version of who God made you to be, to receive His life and life to the full. But in order to do that, you've got to let go of stuff. So stay open as I pray. Father, we thank You this day for, for every element of our worship, for the songs and the prayers, for the sketch, for the communion, for the word, for every aspect. And we're in this place for a reason. You had something you wanted us to hear today, something you wanted us to see, to feel, to know. I pray in this space that whatever blocks us from your best, that we would just have the courage to let go. 
And if others around us, even in our own families and in our closer circles, don't understand or don't appreciate that, help us by your grace to bear with them. But please help us not to be anything other than we are. Help us to grow in our desire to learn, to become, to be all that you made us to be. And it's in Christ we pray. Amen.